Let's suppose you wanted to become a basic psychologist. How would you do this? Suppose you wanted to work in a university setting. How would you do this? First thing that you need to do is get an undergraduate degree. And my advice to you, get a four-year degree. Most graduate programs, they require a four-year degree to get into these graduate programs. So an undergraduate degree, which is four years long. Then you wind up applying into graduate school. And the length of graduate school varies. But we could say a rough timetable would be something like five years or so. And some people do take longer to get this. Many people who work as professors, they have Bachelor of Science, Master's of Science degrees, and then ultimately PhDs. If you want to teach in a university setting, full-time that is, you will need a PhD or a doctoral degree of some sort. So what are some of the professional requirements for basic psychologists? One of the things, or one of the expressions you, you may hear is this idea of publish or perish. You may be wondering, what exactly does that mean? In order to keep your job, what you need to do is publish articles in peer-reviewed academic journals. You may be saying, well, how hard could that be? It is quite difficult to publish stuff in, or publish material in peer-related journals. So this is the main thing that university professors do. So an active research program and publishing, and then combined with this, they will engage in teaching. So what are some of the areas that psychologists would work in if you're a basic psychologist? Well, there's a variety of areas you potentially could be working in. Developmental psychology would probably be one of the biggest basic areas of psychology. Somewhere in the ballpark of about 25% of basic psychologists work as developmental psychologists. Another big area is social psychology. So my advice to you is if you're trying to get a job, study in one of those areas. There's a higher probability that, in fact, you will get a job. You also have other individuals which are considered experimental psychologists who may be involved with things like sensation and perception, as an example. Other psychologists are physiological. Others study personality. And this really rounds out what we mean by basic psychologists. On the other hand, maybe you want to become an applied psychologist. I don't know how many of you watch The Sopranos. You look at a therapist on The Sopranos, for example. Maybe you want to be in a capacity such as this. So how do you become a psychologist? First of all, you need an undergraduate degree of four years. Make note that the undergraduate degree for a basic psychologist and applied psychologist can be virtually the same. It's when you apply into graduate school where everything changes. So you finish your four-year degree, and then you apply into graduate school. Now, depending upon where you practice, graduate school could take you anywhere between two years to five years. Why is it less time? Well, in certain provinces and perhaps certain states, all you need to practice psychology is a master's degree, which can take you about two years. On the other hand, if you're dealing with a PhD or a doctoral degree of some sort, you're going to be spending at least five years. Uh, in the graduate program as an applied psychologist. Now, applied psychologists, in terms of the degrees, they have things like Masters of Arts, Masters of Education. You're going to see sometimes a PsyD degree. And you may be wondering, well, what exactly is a, a PsyD degree? A PsyD degree is a Doctor of Psychology degree. On the other hand, most individuals that work in the field are going to have PhDs, which is a Doctor of Philosophy. Now, in terms of a doctor of philosophy, you usually will have a specialization in either clinical psychology, counseling psychology, and sometimes even school psychology. Now, what do you got to do to become an applied psychologist? The professional requirements. You'll have to complete an internship. In many cases, it's about a year long. In some cases, it's two years long. After your doctoral degree or after your master's degree. Then you're going to have to complete an exam, which is called the EPPP which is the examination of professional practice in psychology. Following this, then you're going to have an oral exam, which, trust me, does not involve going to the dentist. In a scenario like that, you're being tested by three or more seasoned clinicians, and they often ask about your knowledge of ethics and so forth. So as you can see, there's really a lot involved with becoming an applied psychologist. What are some of the subspecialties in applied psychology? One of the things I hear over and over again from students is they want to become clinical psychologists. And if they can't become clinical psychologists, they can't become psychologists, period. I would say that this is faulty reasoning. Certainly, clinical psychology is a subspecialty, but it's not the only subspecialty. 
most students apply into clinical psychology. This is otherwise known as the clinical bias. And they'd say approximately two-thirds of students apply into these areas. However, we also have applied psychologists in the counseling area. We also have applied psychologists in the educational or school settings, and also industrial psychologists. So what are the goals of psychology? We really have four. Whether you're a basic psychologist or an applied psychologist, four goals. They are to describe phenomena. So that's number one. I would say that psychologists are very good at describing phenomena. The second goal that we have is explaining why somebody would do what they do. We're not as good at explaining why people do what we do. We have these fancy regression equations which help us to do these types of things. However, the prediction of behavior is incomplete. Third, we try to predict what people will do. And finally, we attempt to modify what individuals do in terms of their behavior. And I would say that this last goal is really more the realm of applied psychology than it would be basic psychology. I don't know how many of you have heard of an individual named Charles Whitman. Charles Whitman was an individual who, back to the 1960s, 1966 specifically, he wound up killing his mother, he wound up killing his wife, and the next day he wound up killing 14 people by shooting individuals with a sniper rifle from the, the University of Texas Tower. Now my question to you is, how would you explain why somebody would do something like this? What would be the motivation behind this? Ultimately, he was assassinated. In fact, if you check the internet, you'll find that there are different references to Charles Whitman on the net, even some of the letters that he wrote just before he died. So if we look at it in terms of the four goals of psychology, we could say, we look at description. So what was he doing? Second, if we try to explain his behavior, we'd be asking the question, why did he kill his wife? Why did he kill his mother? Why did he kill these other university students? Third, if we're talking about prediction, what would he do next? If he was left untreated, ultimately, potentially, what would he do? And then finally, we're looking at modification or the control of behavior. How would we treat somebody like this? Whenever we're dealing with psychological phenomena, you've got to keep in mind that Psychology is one of these disciplines where there isn't a single paradigm which explains why we do what we do. So there's multiple explanations for this. And we can think of it at least in three different ways. We can think of his explanation or his behavior from a, from a biological point of view. Was there something about his biology that prompted him to be in a particular direction? Was there something about his psychology that prompted him to go in a particular direction. And then finally, we could think of it from an environmental point of view. Was there something in the environment that prompted him to go a particular way? So if we look at it from a biological point of view, we could say maybe there was some sort of chemical imbalance with this individual. So that would be one explanation. Psychologically, maybe this was an individual that hated university students, or some of you may even say this was an evil act. But then you'd be left with the question, what exactly does that mean? And then we can also look at it from the perspective, an environmental perspective. Maybe it has something to do with our culture and our fascination with guns is why he did what he did. The take-home sort of message in the case of Charles Whitman is that he had a brain tumor, and this was why he did what he did. So the explanation for Whitman's behavior is actually an exception in psychology. Often when we're trying to explain why people do what they do, there's usually more than one reason why individuals would do what they do.